Okay, so it's really my pleasure to have Reka Thomas back on campus after quite a few years. <laughs> She's a Cornell PhD. She got her uh, PhD in operations research in 1994 and has been for many years now at the University of Washington, Seattle. She's a professor in mathematics. Uh, her work started out really, she was inclined towards combinatorial optimization and then here she met Baron Sternfels and started doing more computational algebra type stuff. And there's a flavor of both combinatorics and algebra through most of her work. And her prestige just continues to rise, sort of give an indication in 2012. She was a plenary speaker at the International Mass Programming Symposium. In 2014, she was a plenary speaker at the SIAM Conference on Optimization. And this summer, she was a plenary speaker at the SIAM Conference on Applied Algebraic Geometry. So, great pleasure to have you, Reka. Thank you very much. It's, it's been really great to come back. It's nice to see so many old faces, and nothing has changed so much. We used to hang out in CAM a lot when I was a graduate student, um, although I was from OR because they had good computers. Um, anyway, so my goal today is to tell you a little bit about um, algebraic vision. And this is a term that we coined for the study of problems in computer vision from an algebraic point of view. So by that I mean either using techniques from algebraic geometry or using techniques from uh, optimization that are algebraically oriented, so polynomial optimization, semi-definite programming, that kind of thing, okay? So sort of an algebraic geometry type view on vision problems. And um, computer vision, as you know, is the science of making the computer see what your eye sees. So typically these problems, many of these problems come, uh, they are problems in three-dimensional space. So to a mathematician, this seems very simple. And quickly you'll see these problems become very hairy. They're complicated and they, they really test the existing tools that we have. Okay. So what I want to do today is to tell you about a very specific piece of work, just to give you an, a flavor of what these types of problems are. And this is joint work with these three people you see here. So Samir Agarwal is at Google in Seattle. He uh, is a computer vision expert and kind of the main computer vision contact. I've been working with Samir for a few years now on different aspects of vision problems from this kind of point of view. Uh, Han Long Lee is a joint PhD student with Samir and me. He's finishing his PhD in math at uh, UW. And Ben Strumfoss, who many of you know, who was also my thesis advisor, so it's, it's great to be working with him again. He's a UC Berkeley math professor. Okay, so um, let me give you a little context. So computer vision is very, very vast, and it sort of shows up everywhere in real life, right? Phones, computers, uh, cameras, data centers, maps, all over the place. But within that, there is a small subfield called multi-view geometry, or structure for motion. And this, uh, this is the area that we've been focused in. So this book, for instance, is the standard reference in multi-view geometry. It's a really lovely book written by Richard Hartley, who's at Sydney, and Andrew Sisman, who's at Oxford. And they make all their figures available for free, which is great. So you will see a few figures uh, in my talk. If you're seriously interested in this field, here are two other books that we found quite useful. Uh, Invitation to 3D Vision, Yima and Collaborators. And then this, this third book, Theory of Reconstruction from Image Motion by Stephen Maybank. Okay. So I won't give very many references, in fact, no references to vision in, in my talk. Instead, I want to kind of refer to these books as the, the place to look for the background. So everything I will say is kind of standard stuff in vision, and these books explain all of these things very well. Okay, so to begin with, before I can tell you any problem at all in vision, we need to agree on what we mean by a camera. So I need to define what a camera is before we can go forward. So what is a camera? So at a very high level, it's just a map from R3 to R2, okay? Now, if you use that definition, then you can model all sorts of cameras. But the type of camera that we want to focus on is one that models central projection, okay? So an example of that is the basic pinhole camera. So let's just start with that and see what sorts of ingredients you need. So basically, a pinhole camera has two ingredients. So in the corner there, you see this center, which is called C. 
that's the center of the camera. And in my picture, I've located it at the origin of my coordinate frame. Okay? And then the second piece of the camera is that plane that you see that's positioned uh, right here. This is called the image plane. This is the image plane of the camera. And it, this picture over here is a cross-section of that picture. So here is the plane, and here is the center. And the distance between these two is the focal length of the camera. That's f, OK, little f. So now, what does it mean to take a picture? So we have these two, these two pieces. So let's say we want to take a picture of this big three-dimensional point, big x. Then what you do is you join this big x with a line to the center of the camera, and you record where it intersects the viewing plane. Okay, so this little point here, this little x, that's the image of this big x. This big x is sometimes called the world point, and this, the little x on the viewing plane is the image. Okay? So again, if you come to the cross-section, you can actually calculate the coordinates of this image point pretty easily. So for instance, if our three-dimensional point was this, with coordinates x, y, z, then just by doing some similar triangles here, you see immediately that the, the point here, the image, is fx over z, fy over z, and then there's a comma f because this plane is positioned at z equals f. Okay? So typically we drop that because the third coordinate is always little f, so we drop it and we write it as a map from r3 to r2. Okay? So this is a map. So this is good. This is a camera. Now the only bad thing about it is it's not a linear map. It would be great if it was a linear map because we could do nice things with it. Okay? So in vision, there's a little trick that turns this into a linear map. So what they do is they work in projective space. Okay, so instead of working in R3 and R2, you work in P3 and P2. And how do you do that? You simply bump up those two points that you see on the left by adding a 1 to the last coordinate. Okay? So this is projective 3 space. And this is my world point now. It has four coordinates, four homogeneous coordinates. And then this is the image, which is in two-dimensional projective space with the last coordinate one. Okay? Now, the because this is living in projective space, I only have to worry about this up to scale. So I could multiply throughout by z, clear, clear the denominators. And then what happens is this point, if I multiply throughout by c, z becomes exactly the product of this matrix with the input. Okay? The input is x, y, z, 1. And if you multiply out, you will see this times this is fx, which is here. I multiplied through by z, so this is gone. Then I get fy, and then I get a z, and then I get, uh, yeah, that's all. Okay. So now we've made this a linear map. This image is the product of this 3 by 4 matrix times the input vector, which was x, y, z, comma 1. Okay. All right, so this, this 3 by 4 matrix is called the camera matrix. It contains the focal point, uh, the focal length, for instance inside of it, right, contains the little f. OK, so now let's just generalize from here. So if I have a camera that's in general position or not exactly in the nice positions I had, then in general we have what's called a general projective camera. And this is simply a map from now on from P3 to P2. It takes a world point big X to its image, which is some matrix P times the world point X. So this, this x is the same as that x. So this should have been bold. And then that product is called the image. And I will always denote that with little x. So we have big x in P3 being mapped to little x in P2. And the map is simply multiplication by a 3 by 4 matrix. Okay. So this, this matrix P that you see on the extreme right, that's a 3 by 4 matrix with real entries. It can be, don't worry about the A and the B for right now. It's just a 3 by 4 matrix with uh, real entries. It has to have rank 3, otherwise it will collapse your image, right? So you want to image your world into a two-dimensional plane, not onto a line or a point. So the rank has to be 3. And such a thing has 11 degrees of freedom, right? Because it has 12 entries, but we only care up to scale. This is a projective map. So it doesn't matter if I multiply through with a, with a common multiplier. So it has 11 degrees of freedom. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, a camera is a 3 by 4 matrix of rank 3 up to scale. Okay, so that's, that's how we should think about it. Okay, so if you go with that definition, then you can extract some of the features we saw before. So for instance, the center of the camera is simply the right kernel. So it's a 3 by 4 matrix that has a unique, uh, it has a one-dimensional right kernel. In projective space, that's a single point. So that's the center of the camera. 
And now, among all these types of cameras, there are finite ones and infinite ones. Okay, so let me uh, define what that is. So for that, I go back to this, this decomposition I wrote there. So let's take our three by four matrix, call the first three by three block A, and the last column B. Okay, so I just partition it. Now, if the A part, the first three by three part, if that's not singular, then you can compute the C. This, the, the center turns out to be like this. Okay, you can plug this in into that, that, this equation, and you see that it's satisfied. Okay? So in particular, the last coordinate turns out to be 1. So in other words, the center is a finite point in, in, uh, in projective space. So these are called finite cameras. And if the A matrix is not invertible, then you have an infinite camera. So let's only talk about finite cameras today. The first A 3 by 3 block is invertible. So if that is the case, then you can actually decompose this camera even more. Okay? So we start seeing more structure in the camera. So what, how is that? So we have this A, which is 3 by 3 invertible. So I can do a QR decomposition on it. right? So let me write it as the product of an upper triangular matrix and a rotation matrix. So this is actually RQ decomposition. And then if I do this and pull the K out, then this B that you see there will get modified, and it turns into something else, which I will call T. Okay? So that decomposition up there, I've written it like this. So the K is the upper triangular matrix that came from the QR decomposition of A. This is a rotation. This is whatever is left. This is T. This is a translation vector. Okay, so that's what's here. So K upper triangular with positive diagonal, R is a rotation. Okay, so if this K matrix is known, okay, if that K matrix is known, we call the camera calibrated. So in that case, you can actually multiply the whole thing with the K inverse, and then the calibrated uh, camera is just a rotation and a translation. But if it's uncalibrated, then you have this more general three by four matrix structure. Okay, so today we'll talk about both calibrated cameras and uncalibrated cameras, and they have different degrees of freedom. So for instance, if you're in the calibrated case, then K is known, so this goes away. Rotation has three degrees of freedom, a T in R3 has three degrees of freedom, so six, but we only care up to scale, so actually five. Okay. So the, the number of the degrees of freedom drop dramatically. And this K contains all the internal parameters of the camera, like focal length, skew, where is the principal point, and so on. But anyway, not important. So this is kind of the vision terminology that we'll need to, to go forward. Okay. So now let me sort of present to you sort of three basic problems in vision that uh, I think are very interesting, and it's, it's sort of the three main problems in this, this blue book that I had in the beginning. So we have this linear model of image formation, right? So we have a world point, big X, on the extreme right. We have a camera, which is a three by four matrix. It multiplies together to give me an image, which is little x. But remember, everything is in projective space, so they're only equal up to a scale. So I will use this tilde to mean that these are equal points, but only up to scale. Okay, so if you want, wanted to write equality, you would have to put a lambda, a scalar lambda in front of this px. Okay, so suppose we believe this. So this is a very a kind of idealized model because in reality you have other problems. There is, you know, lens distortion and all kinds of stuff. But let's let's take this as our model. Then here are sort of three basic geometric questions you can ask that all deal with reconstructing the images, uh, reconstructing the three-dimensional scene that's in front of you. So for instance, the first problem I want to talk about is called resectioning. So in resectioning, what you have is you have one unknown camera. This is P. But what you're given is a whole bunch of world points and their images in this one unknown camera. Okay? And our job is to find the unknown camera such that little xi is the image of big xi. This is called resectioning. Find one camera given world points and images. Then there's a dual kind of problem called triangulation. Here we have one unknown world point. You're given a whole bunch of cameras, and you're given images of this unknown point in those cameras. And our job is to find the unknown world point such that, again, this equation is true. Okay, So one point to find here, one camera to find here. And then you have the full reconstruction problem. Here we don't know the cameras, we don't know the world points, so you don't know any of the stuff. 
But instead, what you're given is a sequence of images of the unknown world points in the unknown cameras. Okay, So let me do this slowly. So this sequence, these are images, one in each camera. So xi1, xi2, up to xin, these are the images of the unknown big xi in camera 1, camera 2, camera 3, up to camera n, which are all unknown too. Cameras are unknown, world points are unknown, but you know these sequences of images. And you have a whole bunch of them. And again, our job is to, in this case, we first have to reconstruct the cameras, then you have to reconstruct the three-dimensional points that gave rise to them. Okay, so that's the full reconstruction problem. And of course, this is the exact problem, right? So here, I'm giving you points, and I'm asking you to reconstruct. There's either reconstruction or not. But in practice, this is not how it comes at you. There are what you're given are noisy images, and you would have to find maximum likelihood estimates. So there's maybe no true reconstruction, but you try to do the best you can. And then that's, that's estimation problems. So these have lots of optimization in them, the last blue line. And I won't talk about any of the optimization, so we'll talk just about geometry today and um, algebraic geometry. Okay. And you can do amazing things. So yesterday I was at the graphics lab. They showed me amazing things you can do with noise images and so on, right? So it's, it's really, really amazing what you can do in practice, I think. It's very impressive. But the questions we are asking are very sort of foundational, basic questions that I will present in a minute. So these are three questions. And for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on the last question. So that's the full reconstruction problem, but in the simplest setting, which is when you have two cameras. Okay, so this is the, the atom of reconstruction, two view reconstruction. And in here, you see already the math problems get pretty hairy. And, um, this is, this is the, the, what's the, the content of the talk. OK, so let me recap again. So we want to come back to the full reconstruction problem, but now with just two cameras. Okay. So this is called two-view geometry. So here's the picture. So here are two cameras, center C and viewing plane. That's one camera. Center C prime and viewing plane, that's the second camera. And I have some points. Suppose I have a world point x, and I take a picture of it in these two cameras. So here I get image little x, here I get image little y. And the thing you see immediately is that all these points are constrained together. So this big x, little x, c, c prime, y, they all lie on a single plane, right? They lie on this, this gray plane. This is called the epipolar plane. So in other words, if I tell you that the image of this point is here, then the image of that same point on this viewing plane cannot be anywhere you please. It has to be on this line the intersection of this epipolar plane with this. Okay, So there's a constraint. There's a coplanarity constraint on the two images and the world point and the two centers. So if you translate this into math, uh, so here's my terminology. My two cameras are P1 and P2, and the images are X and Y. And this coplanarity of all these points translates into this, a statement like this. So it says there exists a 3 by 3 matrix called F of rank exactly 2, not rank less equal to 2, rank exactly 2, such that when you make this equation, y transpose fx, equal, uh, it should equal 0. Okay, So this is coplanarity just written in a, in a different way. And this equation is called the epipolar equation. Okay, So this is a basic constraint that has to be satisfied by this picture. And again, just as a reality check, this x and y are living in P2, so they have three coordinates. F is 3 by 3, so everything checks out. You can actually multiply. Okay. This, this F matrix is called the fundamental matrix in vision. And it has seven degrees of freedom. Why? Because it's 3 by 3, so up to scale, it's eight degrees of freedom. But then there's a rank constraint on it. So one more, uh, one more degree falls, drops. So we have seven degrees. And this number seven is kind of important. So this will show up many times. And now, if your two cameras were calibrated, so the, the situation I gave was uncalibrated. So if the two cameras are calibrated, then instead of F, you have another matrix. It's called the essential matrix, E. It also has to satisfy this epipolar equation on the two images. But what is this E? This E has rank two, so in particular, it is a fundamental matrix. But it has an additional property. It has to have this property that the first two singular values are equal 
and the, se the third singular value has to be zero, right? Because it's rank two, so that's zero. But the first two singular values have to be equal, okay? So that's the, the additional condition you need if you have a calibrated camera. And another way to see this th is that this E matrix has to be the product of a rotation and a skew symmetric matrix. So there are many characterizations of what this matrix is. And it's a quite a bit more complicated than the F. And this has five degrees of freedom, again, because rotation has three, skew symmetric three by three has three degrees of freedom up to scale five. So seven and five are, are kind of important numbers in what's coming up. So is this okay? This is, this is the basic setup of two view geometry. Okay, so why, why is, so one quick comment. So if I know this F or this E, that's equivalent to knowing the cameras. So from F and E, you can reconstruct the cameras. From the cameras, you can reconstruct the world points, okay? So really, reconstruction is about finding these three by three matrices. So it's really a story about these small matrices, three by three, and uh, they, have, they are constrained like this. So this, this theorem here at the bottom is saying what I just said. So there's something called the projective reconstruction theorems, theorem that says if I have these correspondences, xi and yi are images of the same point, uh, big xi, if these are point correspondences that satisfy these epipolar equations for some f, then we can reconstruct two cameras and world points up to a projective transformation. So you, you will be off by a projective transformation unless there's some degeneracy, so these big XIs lie on the line joining the two camera centers. So then you cannot reconstruct, but otherwise you can. Okay, so this is just a little slide that tells you that basically finding F and E is equivalent to reconstructing. So that's going to be the goal for knowing whether you can reconstruct. Okay, so here's the main question I wanna ask. So suppose now you have these two cameras, two unknown cameras, and I'm given a whole bunch of points in one side, one, one viewing plane, and a whole bunch of points on the other viewing plane. These are the xi's, those are the yi's, and I'm told, and they're already paired up. So I'm told that this x1 and this y1 are images of the same unknown point. x2 and y2 are images of the same unknown point and so on, they're already paired up. So this pairing question is actually very difficult and a big task. It's a huge matching problem that people run in the background, and this is it's huge amounts of combinatorial optimization in it. And it's, it's very fascinating how they pair this up, right? So if you take pictures from Flickr, or um, I learned yesterday it's called pictures from the wild, which is kind of cool, uh, then you have to be able to know the corner here is the same as the corner there and so on, right? You have to be able to match these points before you can even start asking this question. So that in itself is, I think, very interesting and, and large scale optimization. But let's assume that's given, the pairing is given. So then the question I wanna ask is this, does there exist a 3D reconstruction of these M correspondences? Okay, no noise, just a pure geometric question. Did these come from M points in three-dimensional space? And it, so the answer is either yes or no. Okay, that's all. And as we just saw, the answer is yes, if and only if you can find either F or E, one of these matrices, which I'm calling epipolar matrices, that satisfy these uh, epipolar equations, okay? So that's, that's what we need to do. So, of course, what you can do is, these, the, the xi's and y's are given to you, right? So you could write these equations. This is going to be then linear equations in F, right? F is the only unknown. But F has a constraint on it, namely it has to have rank two. It's not just any three by three. So you could solve and you could look. Is there an F, is there not an F? This works really, really fast, okay? So in some sense, there's nothing to do. You can just do the computation and look. But that's not what we're asking. We just want to, we would like to know what's exactly the mathematics behind this, right? What's the geometry behind these points that actually prevent a reconstruction or allow a reconstruction? So that's, that's the question I would like to address. And you will see that, so the gist is that in the F case, you can answer this precisely and completely. And in the E case, it gets pretty difficult because you start running into real algebraic geometry and questions about real solutions to polynomials. So it's, it's, a, it's a much more difficult question in that case. Okay, so we don't want to compute the F and the E, we would like to just test from the input 
whether there is a reconstruction or not. Are there any questions? This may be a good point to ask before I tell you the results. So this is the goal, okay? So it's two view reconstruction, which is the, the basic atom of all reconstruction problems. So if you, you really need to know how to do two view before you can do higher views. Okay, so let me just give you one slide on basic baby algebraic geometry because we will use quite a bit of this in what's coming. I only need very little, um, but just in case you have, you're not familiar with these terms, it's, it will be useful. So we already saw projective space. So P N sub R means projective space over the real numbers. So that means you're looking at um, real, uh, the real vector space R to the N plus one without the origin. And then you're identifying two points if they agree up to a scale. Okay, so that's projective space. And then within projective space, you, we have varieties. So if you have a set V in this projective space, we call it a variety. If you can find a bunch of polynomials, say F1 through FT, such that this V is the set of all solutions to these T polynomials. So in other words, V is cut out by polynomial equations. So that's a projective variety. And every projective variety has a dimension, which is kind of what you think it is. And then it has a co-dimension, which is n minus the dimension. Okay, so let me do a simple linear example because this is the only kind of example we will actually need. So for instance, if I have a seven by nine matrix, real matrix of rank seven, then we can look at the kernel of this matrix. Let's call it L. So this is two dimensional if you think of it as a vector space in R to, uh, R to the nine, right? But in projective space, it's actually one dimensional because the dimension drops by one. So it's a one dimensional um, line. It's called a line in projective space. So in projective space, everything drops by one, roughly. And it ha it'll have co dimension eight, seven. So it lives in P8, even though there are nine coordinates because we, we have to drop one. And then dimension is one and co dimension is seven. So this is the ambient dimension, and these two numbers should add up to eight. Okay? So this is dimension co-dimension. And then there's one more concept we need, which is degree, okay? So if I have a projective variety V, and I have a subspace L, both in the same projective space, uh, and the dimension of the subspace is exactly the co-dimension of the variety. So they have complementary dimensions. Then when you intersect the subspace with the variety, you will get finitely many points. And that number of points generically is called the degree. So think of cubic curve, you cut it with a line, generically we expect three points, right? That's the degree. And so it's the same thing in high dimensional space. Um, of course, here I'm doing everything over complex numbers, so this is a statement over complex numbers, and most of the time we'll need to do things over real numbers, which is the hard part, okay? Over complex numbers, you can say lots of nice things. Over real numbers, we basically get lost at some point. That's, that's what's going to happen. OK, so these are, these are a few notions that we will need. OK, so now I'm going to reformulate my existence question into an intersection question. And then the question is, is there an intersection or is there not an intersection? OK. So again, everything is about three by three matrices. So hopefully nobody is uh, overwhelmed by this. But although this is a technical slide, so I apologize. I just want to reformulate it once. If you don't understand it, please let me know. Um, so let's start by looking at the set of all um, three by three matrices of rank at most two, okay? So I use this funny notation, which is actually very helpful for us, but might be a bit confusing. So this big A is a three by three matrix, and this little A is the vec of a, big A, right? The vectorization of A. So I take the three rows, I'd unwrap it into a nine-dimensional vector and then put it in projective space so it actually lives in P8, okay? So when I write this, I just mean uh, I'm looking at all the little a's in P8 over the complex numbers such that the rank of the matrix is at most two. So that's just the set of all complex three by three matrices. That's R2, okay? It's an algebraic variety. It has dimension seven and degree three. And similarly here, R1 is the set of all three by three matrices of rank at most one. 
So R1 lives inside R2. Okay? And what do we care about? We want to care about these two matrices, right? Fundamental and essential matrices. So the fundamental matrices are the rank, is the complement of R1 in R2. So it's the matrices of rank exactly two. Okay? So it's not a variety anymore. It's like the difference of two varieties. So R2 minus R1, but over the reals, not over the complexes. Okay? So these are real matrices. Essential matrices are a subset of that with that extra singular value condition. So here's my cartoon. So R2 is this whole thing. And then inside we have R1. And the difference of the two is F. So F is all this blue stuff. And then including the yellow. So the yellow part is the subset that's the set of essential matrices. Okay? So script F are going to be the set of our fundamental matrices. Inside that, the set of essential matrices. OK, so what does it mean for a reconstruction to exist? So here is the next piece of the technical part. So let's just start here. So we said that there is an F if and only if all my point correspondences satisfy these, these equations. Right? These are the ethical equations. So now let's turn this, if you, if you like SDP, this is actually very familiar stuff. Let's turn this into a matrix equation. So we put this F here, 3 by 3. And then I take this y transpose and put it here. So I get a xi times yi transpose. This is a rank one matrix, right? This is a three by three matrix. And then I take the, the inner product in matrix space, which is the trace product. So it's the trace of the product of these two. Okay, we have to transpose one. So these equations being true is the same as these matrix linear equations being true. Now these are linear equations in matrix space. So I'm looking for an F, uh, which means it has to have rank two, such that these linear equations are, are true. And now, in other words, what we're saying is, if I'm given data, I'm looking for something that's orthogonal to all my data once I turn it into this thing. So I'm really looking for something in the kernel of something, right? So what I'm looking for is some little f, which is a long vector, such that Oh, OK, actually, before we go there. So let's take these, these rank one matrices and let's vectorize them again and make them the rows of a big matrix, which I'm going to call Z. Okay. So then this product is just saying that I'm looking for a little f that lies in the kernel of Z. Right? So every one of those rows must dot to 0 with the vectorization of this thing. Okay? So this is where this kernel is coming up. So really, we're looking for. Uh, my, my, all my data, xi's and yi's, they turn into this matrix. This is an m by, m by 9 matrix. It has lots of rows, because we don't know how many point correspondences we have. But it has only nine columns. And so we're looking, we are asking whether the kernel of this matrix, z, that comes from data, actually intersects this f set. If it does, then there is a reconstruction. If, if it doesn't, there is no reconstruction. Okay, that's, that's the question. So that's what we would like to do. And then if the cameras are calibrated, it's the same thing. We, are, we set up this kernel, and we ask, does it intersect the E set? OK? So if this was confusing, then all you need to remember is that there are two fixed sets, F and E. They're th sets of 3 by 3 matrices. The different point correspondences make turn themselves into a subspace. And this subspace could have different dimensions. It's not always the same dimension. And what I would like to know is, does my subspace intersect the given set F or the given set E? If, if it does, yes, there is a reconstruction. If it doesn't, there is no reconstruction. That's where we are. Okay. So how do you do this? You have a fixed set. You have all these varying subspaces coming at you. Every time you'd like to determine, is there an intersection or is there no intersection? How do you do this fast? What kind of conditioning do you see? If I intersect once and get a point, and then I slightly change my data, what happens to the reconstruction? Does it like wildly change, or does it just slightly change? I mean, all this is totally open, actually. So in, in, in reality, it seems like you just solve every time from scratch. But there should be some very nice theory that sits behind this, right? It's as simple as you can get. You have subspaces cutting some set F. So that's, that's basically the question. So this is geometrically what we're asking. Does a subspace intersect a set? OK, so now I'll tell you the answers. And these are fairly high level, so no more highly technical things. So for the fundamental matrices, 
Um, first of all, so this Z matrix, whose kernel we're interested in, this is an M by 9 matrix. Okay. So we're going to organize everything by the rank of this matrix. So the rank is only 1, 2, 3, up to 9. There are only finitely many cases. So there are no complexity issues here. It's everything that runs in constant time. Okay, There's no, It's not a difficult complexity type question. It's more uh, the geometry that's interesting. So if the rank of Z is 9, of course, the kernel is empty. There's nothing to do. Okay, So 9 is out. If the rank is 8, then the kernel is one-dimensional. You can pick a generator from that kernel. This is a nine-dimensional vector. Turn it into a 3 by 3 matrix. Check its rank. Okay, So that's also easy. So these two are no problem. 9 and 8 are done. Now, what happens if the rank is less or equal to 7? This is where the problems start. So what happens is, if the rank is less or equal to 7, then as we saw in that little example a while ago, the, let's say the rank is exactly 7. Then the kernel is a one-dimensional complex variety. It'll cut the seven-dimensional R2, right? Because if they're complementary dimensional, it'll cut it in a point. If the kernel is even fatter, meaning the rank is lower, then it'll cut it even more. So come over the complex numbers, there are going to be first finitely many intersection points, then infinitely many intersection points. Okay? So you think, OK, there has to be a real intersection. There are, there are so many intersection points, especially when you start getting infinitely many complex points. There has to be an intersection. So the first thing we can say is that when, um, even over the reals, not just over the complex numbers, the, the kernel will intersect R2, the space of 2 by 2 matrices, sorry, 3 by 3 matrices of rank at most 2. But it doesn't mean there's an F, because the, all of this intersection could be rank 1. So you may never get something that's rank 2, even though it's cutting R2. R2 is everything that's rank deficient, right? So that's, that's one type of problem that we have to either say, OK, that's never going to happen, or it can happen, and here's how you rectify it. So here's sort of a little trick to sort of deal with this, OK? So we're going to parametrize the kernel. So let's take the kernel of the matrix. Let's say it's, it's spanned by some matrices, A1 to AT. And then I make a formal linear combination of them. So I will take sum of AI, UI, and let's call it M of U. So these UIs are symbols. So this matrix, this is a 3 by 3 matrix again, but now it's filled with U's, which are symbols, OK? And this is a parameterization of the whole kernel, right? Because I've just taken all possible linear combinations formally. And what happens if the kernel is entirely inside R2? So everything in your kernel is, consists of matrices of rank at most 2. Then what happens is when you take the determinant of the symbolic matrix, which is just a 3 by 3 matrix, you will get the zero polynomial. Not just the zero number, just the zero polynomial. The entire thing is zero. Okay? So that's very easy to check. If the kernel is entirely in R1, meaning all the matrices in the kernel have rank at most 1, then all the 2 by 2 minors of this symbolic matrix will be zero polynomials. Not zero, just zero polynomials. Okay? So it's very easy to check if your kernel is entirely in R2 or entirely in R1. That's not so hard. So we're going to use this. So this is a good trick. But before that, let me give you a few examples. So here's rank 7. So rank 7 in vision is usually considered fine. There's always an F because there's something called the seven-point algorithm. It'll always return an F. But no, it won't. Okay. So here's an example. So here are seven sets of XIs and YIs, which you put here in the, as the rows of these two matrices. Kernel is spanned by this and this. Okay. Let's make the formal linear combination. Here it is. And you can just look at it and see this will never be rank 2. right? No matter how you put in U1 and U2, this is a rank 1 matrix. So this, will, will, this is an, a real example that's not highly degenerate or anything, for which there is no real intersection, even though there are three, uh, even though uh, there are complex intersections and there are matrices that, ha that are rank deficient, that are real, but they're not rank 2. They, they have too low a rank. Okay. So this was the case where the intersection was a bunch of points. Then you think, OK, maybe that's fine. OK, a bunch of points sometimes maybe will fail. Let's go one more rank down, OK, 6. So now the intersection over the complex is, is infinite. right? And you can still fail to have a fundamental matrix. So you will cut the rank 2 variety in infinitely many complex points. 
but there's not even one single real point in this intersection that has rank two. That's that's the point. Okay. Uh, so here's another example. Kernel is spanned by these three guys, and there's nothing in the last two rows of these three matrices. So the symbolic thing looks like this. It'll never be rank two. Okay. So this, I think, these two examples were very surprising to us because the general idea is the, the general wisdom is that once you're seven or below, there's always reconstruction. And this, this shows no, there is not. You do have to do something. It's really a rank two condition. It's not as simple as just determinant zero, right? So we need some kind of theorem that says, when is there a rank two matrix? Not rank less equal to two, but rank exactly two. Okay, so you need some kind of structural result that will finish it. Okay, so before I get there, let's, uh, let's go one more dimension down, okay? So now the kernel is even fatter, and you think, okay, now there's got to be real points, and this is true, okay? So if the rank drops below five, there's always real matrix of rank exactly two, and the proof is quite hard, actually. So the, the original proof used the Fano scheme and all kinds of crazy algebraic geometry facts, but now the proof is actually quite simple. There's a few things you need. There's like rank one update you need to know how to do, then there's a couple of other things. So it's now a simple proof, but still it, it requires somebody, like three other theorems that were published in like some other papers, okay? So it's not, a fa it's not so easy to, to argue that there is rank two. But below five, we're good. So six and seven were the problem. And to deal with that, this is the key structural lemma that you need. So this is actually a very nice exercise in linear algebra, actually. I think. I think not so easy. I found this proof a little hard. Um, this was, uh, yeah. So this, this is really what did it. So here's a, here's a lemma about three by three matrices, okay, which is kind of fun. So it says if you take a positive dimensional subspace in the space of three by three matrices over the reals, everything's projective, so we only care up to scale, okay? If you take a positive dimensional subspace, that is not entirely in R2, so there's at least something that's invertible in this subspace. Okay, one three by three invertible matrix exists. And when you take the determinant of this three by three MU, this is very easy, right? This is a three by three matrix, I can take its determinant, I can factor it, there's not any big problem. And if it doesn't look like this, so the, what is this? This is a linear function, B transpose U. So if it doesn't look like the cube of a linear form, then it has to have a rank two matrix. Okay, so it's a sufficient condition. It's not a necessary condition. You can fit, you can look like this and still have a rank two, but it's a sufficient condition. It's saying that the, if the determinant doesn't look like the cube of a linear form, then there is a rank two. And that's enough. This kills everything. So basically, with this lemma, you can do rank seven. You can do rank six. So in rank seven and rank six, there is some set. There's some geometric region where reconstructions exist, and this lemma will tell you where that is. Okay, so I didn't write it down, but it finishes the entire F story. So you, knew, you need something like this, I think, to do things in general. This is the easiest situation of fundamental matrices, and um, this, this, is the, this was the key lemma that finished it. Okay, so that ends the story of F, which is the uncalibrated case. I'm told that uncalibrated cameras don't exist now because of digital cameras and so on. Everybody knows something about the camera that you're using. So this is sort of old fashioned stuff, but it's a nice, I think you need to do this before you can do E and you'll see that E is a whole other beast, okay? So this is nice, this is essentially linear algebra. Okay, now let's come to essential matrices. So. Again, are there any questions, any comments? I know there are lots of vision people here, so feel free to complain, whatever you want to do. Otherwise, I'll go to E. <laughs> okay, sorry, it's very hard for me to know what background to assume, so I myself did not know vision, so I explained the vision part maybe more than the algebraic geometry, but if, if it's the other way, then feel free to ask. Okay, now let's come to essential matrices. So again, the question is this, okay? So we have the set E. These are three by three matrices with first two singular values equal. I want to know that given my subspace, does it cut it? That's the question, okay? Does it cut it? Over the real, everything is real because E is a set of real three by three matrices. So this is E, two singular values equal, one singular value zero. 
Okay. Now, this variety is actually surprisingly famous. Okay, so this is actually a variety. So this is cut out by polynomials. And this was worked on by Damazur, who's a very well-known algebraic geometer from France in, the, in 1988. Um, so I think like in, in India and in Sofiantopolis, this, there was a person called Forgeras who now does uh, brain recognition and stuff like that. So he was very into this and they must have been friends or something. It's, it's, a, it's a bizarre connection. But this was actually looked at by Damazur. So by the way, all these reconstruction type questions are very, very old, right? Because they appeared in photogrammetry like 100, more than 100 years ago. They were looked at by you know, Hesse and Strom. And so these are very old questions in, in, in some sense. We are asking for geometric, you know, because people were interested in paintings. They would like to know what is the three-dimensional picture that was painted onto this uh, painting and so on. So these are fairly old questions. So the first result by Damazur is that this E is actually a variety, and it's cut out by 10 cubics, okay? So the cubics are this. So first of all, we know determinant is zero. We already know this is a rank two matrix. But then in addition, the matrix has to satisfy this matrix equation, okay? So E, E transpose E is a three by three matrix. This is a three by three matrix. So the difference is a three by three matrix. So I want every entry in that three by three matrix to be zero. So if you do this symbolically, you will get nine constraints coming from here, one coming from here. They're all cubics, so there are 10 cubic equations, okay? So that's, that's what cuts out E. So if you look at all real points that satisfy, real three by three matrices that satisfy these two things, that's the set of essential matrices. Now, you can pass to the complex numbers. You can say, okay, let's just look at our complex three by three matrices that satisfy this. It's always easier, so we go there. This in algebraic geometry is called the Zariski closure of the E, okay? So we put a C on, at the bottom. It's over the complex numbers. And what Damazur proved is that, that this over the complex numbers, this thing is a irreducible variety, meaning it doesn't break into pieces, and it has dimension five and degree 10. And so this, just by my little algebraic geometry slide, this is saying that if I cut this variety, so the whole thing is living in P8. So if I cut this variety with a subspace of dimension at least three, which is three is the complementary dimension to five in eight, then I will get complex intersection points. First I'll get points, then I will get curves, then I will get higher dimensional surfaces and so on, right? So as long as we have as long as the rank of my Z matrix is less or equal to five, I'm guaranteed complex intersections, okay? All right, so what can we say? So if the rank is less or equal to four, there's actually an E. That's the first one. Again, the proof is quite, quite involved, okay? So, up, so rank less or equal to three is very easy. And then the rank equal to four is saying that when I cut my subspace, with, uh, when I cut the E variety, the complex E with the, with the subspace, what I'm getting is a curve. That's the situation we're in, okay? I get a curve. So that means there are infinitely many points on this curve complex. One of them is real. I'm guaranteeing you that one of them is real. And here we are explicitly producing this real point for you in the proof, okay? So this, this is not so simple. And, and this case was actually quite difficult. But any case, if you're below four, you're good. So there is an E. Uh, if you're eight, you're easy again because you have this one dimensional kernel, you do your usual check, you compute the kernel, you, you see if it satisfies all these Damazur cubics. If it does, you're good. So eight below four is good, eight and above are good. So what about all the in-between cases, right? So five, six, seven, this is the hot point. Now five is what everyone in computer vision does. This, there's something called the five-point algorithm. So this is exactly where the intersection is a collection of points, okay? And now things, people know things are bad. So Demazur already had an example where he showed that all of these, so how many, you'll get 10 points, right? Because the degree is 10 when you do this cutting. This is, the, this is called the minimal case when you get points. And um, so there are examples where all 10 are real and distinct intersection points, in which case you have 10 possible E's, so 10 possible reconstructions, or all 10 may be complex and not real, okay? So there could be no, no reconstruction. So 
the, it's already known that five and six and seven you can fail. Okay, so the, these are the, the reconstruction is only going to exist under special conditions. Okay, so let me formulate this existence question a couple different more times because I think they're all fascinating and they're all difficult and it would be nice to know if uh, anybody has any insights. So you already saw this formulation, which is the one I'm using, that there is an E if and only if this kernel of my matrix intersects the set of essential matrices. Okay, that one you saw. Now, I said that this E is cut out by 10 cubics, but here's another way to cut out this E if you only care about the real points, okay? So that description I gave you is like nice prime ideal and so on, but this description is okay if you only care for real points. Now, this, this polynomial is really beautiful. So on the one hand, we need determinant zero, and on the other hand, what you need is, you take every entry there, square it and add it, that's this, then you take all the two by two minus there, square them and add them, and then multiply with the four, and then equate, okay? It's a quartic polynomial. So can you guarantee me that there's a real intersection when you cut this with a subspace? That's the question, okay? Now here's a, another very fascinating formulation, which is known in vision. All these are known in vision. So this one is really also very interesting. So this is saying that there is a reconstruction if and only, you can if, and only if you can find a single rotation, one rotation, that will rotate all the x points simultaneously, okay? So you ro rotate all the x's simultaneously, cross it with the y's. So for instance, y1 cross rx1 is now a column vector, right? This is a, a, one, a, one, a three by one matrix, three by one matrix. Take the cross product from calculus, stick it here as the column, and then do that every time. So I get a three by m matrix, and the rank should drop. So somehow, I'm given these x's and y's, I rotate all the x's, take cross products, and suddenly I have something on a plane. That's what should happen. And if it exists, there's a reconstruction. If not, no, okay? How do you do this? How do you check for such a rotation? This is, this is very interesting to me. So at the end of the day, all of these are asking, is there a real solution to some polynomial system? And this is a hard problem. This, is, this falls under real algebraic geometry. You could solve this with SDPs, with semi-definite programming, degree by degree. There's something called the real nullstall ansatz that will certify. But all of this is quite hard. It's not a check on just the points. You have to iteratively try different degrees and see if there is a solution or not. Okay, so that's the math of what we have to do. So this is too hard. So I'm going to just pass to the complex numbers and then we'll say a few things about that, okay? So do we still have time? Oh, okay. So um, I will say, so let me see what I want to say actually. Um, actually, let's, let's skip that for a second. Let me, let me come to, yeah, so that's more algebraic geometry if you want to see, yeah, we'll come back. But I, I want to show you some of the calculations. So the gist is that for rank seven, we actually can answer the question, but it's very complicated. We decided not to even put it in the paper. So it's gone, okay, it exists, but it's gone. Five and six, there is the characterization, which we don't know. That's, that's the summary of what's coming. But I want to show you um, some of the ca calculations. So here's rank five, five points. Um, and if you solve the Demazur cubics, um, uh, if you solve the, the equations that go into this, right? So there are, there are 10 cubics here and then linear equations here. If you solve them all together and then eliminate all but one variable, you get this polynomial, okay? This is done in Macaulay to Mike's uh, software package. It's very fast, so it's not computationally difficult to get this, okay? But where did this come from? <laughs> These numbers, they came from those two things, right? So like, what kind of, what is happening? I mean, there's no sense in which those numbers show up. And, and this is an example where there are no E's. So this last polynomial only has complex roots, and therefore there is nothing. We cannot back solve and get everything, okay? So one question as a mathematician you can ask is, can we make some sense of those, those huge coefficients? Then maybe we have some idea, right? And the thing is, yes, there is some sense in these coefficients, okay? So this was done by David Nister, who um, comes from Vision and was at Microsoft for a long time, now works for Tesla. Um, so he discovered the use of Gromner basis in uh, Vision. And this is hugely successful. So I won't explain this. What, I'm, what I want to say is that you do some things, you do some Gaussian elimination on the Demis root cubics, 
and then you set up this, these equations, then you take a determinant. This is it. These are the coefficients. Okay? So, so he understood this without knowing Grobner basis. And then Grobner basis kind of took over vision. And it's, it's very, very successful in vision. So again, if you, don't, um, if you don't know that application in vision, I think it's worth pointing out. So there's this group in um, Prague, uh, Thomas Feidler's group. So they have a lot of solvers that do this kind of calculation. And they use a very particular way of solving for polynomial systems, something called Grobner trace, where they hardwire the calculation because they want to solve a particular system all the time. So they don't need a general solver. They just need this system to work, right? And it'll work in incredible speed, okay? So these are, this is the kind of time that, that they can report for solving these cubics. And it runs on lots of places. I believe this runs in the Android phone as far as I know. So this, this actual calculation of these polynomial systems. Okay? So it's a very impressive um, thing. And uh, so the two slides I skipped, OK, let me. The two slides I skipped are basically telling you there is sort of a, a algebraic geometry theory behind intersecting subspaces with uh, varieties. And, in, and there are two sort of situations where this has been studied a lot. One is the classical, the classical object called Chow forms, which is the first slide I skipped. And then there's a more recent object called the Hurwitz form. Both of these are very important in understanding intersections of subspaces with varieties over the complex numbers. Over the real numbers, it's, it's, a, it's a different story. And maybe we will have a technology for doing that. But let me just stop by, I mean, end by uh, saying this. So this, this conditioning of the problem, right? So if you intersect the variety with the subspace and then vary the subspace slightly, what's happening to this? So this is something that Peter Burgesser in Berlin is helping us with. And he has some kind of uh, nice framework in which you can understand this in general. So if I take a general variety and a general subspace of complementary dimension, then he has something he can, he has several things he can say about conditioning. But when you apply to an actual variety, like this E variety, it gets very difficult because it doesn't satisfy most of the conditions that you would want, it, want his theory to satisfy. So I'll skip this unless you have interest in seeing it later. But let me end with this nice video that I got from Noah, who's here at Cornell, uh, Noah Snavely. And this was uh, a project that was done at UW when I guess Noah was a graduate student. And Samir and uh, Samir is my collaborator, and they all work with uh, Steve Sites, and I guess the whole group moved to Google, so this top part. And Rick Selisky is at Microsoft Research, and they had a project where they wanted to take pictures from Flickr and try to uh, reconstruct whole cities. So let's say if you look in Flickr, you have a picture of every cafe, every monument, every street, every everything is there. So can you reconstruct Rome in a day? So can you just do all the 3D reconstructions? So this is a, a particular reconstruction from, of the Colosseum with 2,000 images roughly, and they're reconstructing those 800,000 points. So this is, how do you do this? Do you do this by, construct, by uh, finding E and F? So let me play it again. So the, the, the map I told you is exactly what we need to do this. Of course, they do estimation and all kinds of other things in the back. So it's much more uh, you know, engineering uh, sophisticated than uh, just the math problem. But these, you see the little cameras sitting in different places, and then they're able to do this kind of reconstruction very, very fast. And now you, and you can do much more sophisticated things. But really, the, and, and the matching problem that I mentioned at the beginning, that has to be done too. Because if you just have pictures from Flickr, you have no idea how things pair up. And, and there's a way to turn the computation of E on its head to actually do the matching problem, to do the matching estimation as well. OK, so that's it. So let me stop here. And I will now end. Are there any quick questions? So that there have to be some group actions that yeah. are acting on the, the, the problem. Absolutely. And the, the, the question is, can you use those in order to reduce the problem to something that is lower dimensional and less complex? 
It's a very good question. So these these varieties, these especially the essential variety or even the rank varieties, they are invariant under the action of the orthogonal group on both sides, right? So they are orthogonally invariant. And we haven't succeeded so much to use them in this context, but we have succeeded in using that action to do other types of computations. So for instance, if you have a variety and you would like to know the close, you know, you're given an outside point, you'd like to project onto this variety, then one of the measures of complexity of that is to find all the critical points of the of the minimization problem, right? So you say, okay, if there are only so many critical points, then we could either, I mean, we could search through them. So the algebraic complexity of those points tell you the complexity of the problem. So there you can do some amazing things. Like if you know this kind of group action, you can actually just collapse the whole thing down to its singular values. So there's this whole uh, technology of what are called transfer principles that's worked on by Adrian Lewis and students and so on. So that allows you to turn that problem which came from algebraic geometry into essentially a combinatorial problem. And then you can answer these questions. So that's kind of the, the only experience I have personally, but it should be that we should be able to exploit both the structure of these polynomials as well as the symmetry. So those nine cubics, they are off by some kind of group action. And that's a more subtle action than just orthogonal matrices. So at the moment, we understand orthogonal action, but not something more complicated. So there's an SO3 action as well. And there should be representation theory that's helpful to, to analyze all this. Yeah. So hopefully in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rekha.